behind you. Uh, I asked some prayers for my great nephew, Dylan Self. He joined the Marines a few months ago, been in San Diego, ended up getting sick with pneumonia, and can't get rid of it, so they're sending him home. He should have landed sometime today. Send him back to Avenue. You want that? Yeah, young lady over here. Yeah, Casey. She's got a hole in her foot. <laughs> and we got it healed yet, but we need to remember. They don't know what it, what it is. So. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for your blessings, Lord. We just thank you for the privilege we have being in your house tonight. Lord, we thank you for these folks that took time out to come and be a part of your service tonight. Lord, we turn this service over to you and ask for your blessings this morning. Lord, we lift up all these folks, Lord, as we go on our prayer list tonight. God, there's so many in our church that need a touch from you. And Lord, we know that you are the great physician, and God, there's nothing impossible for you. So Lord, I just pray that you'll intervene, and God, that you'll touch lives, touch hearts, and touch bodies tonight, God. And the folks will be healed, and God, they can be back doing the things God you have them to do. Lord, that you are a song service tonight, we bless it. And God, that you be a mighty part of the service, and Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what I was fearing. It's all over the whistle. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.
that Brother Mark sang uh, a cappella, actually. Yeah. That first, that was it this, on the Sunday? Anyway, it's a song that he did, and she asked that I get it worked up so y'all get to choose whether we continue to do it or not. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just like that we played it down to my dead decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, don't judge it on our playing in case we mess it up. Judge it on the song and, and the words. He sang it Sunday. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Deacon, and then also it includes 
how each and every one of us should behave in the house of God. You know, God is a God of order. He's not a God of disorder and or dispray or whatever the word that you want to use. Uh, he he loved for his folks to be number one in one accord, one place, one mind. So that everybody is on the same page. It's not one person running off this direction trying to do something or somebody else running off this direction and trying to do something. It causes nothing but chaos and it usually ends up hurting the church more than it does helping it. So he gives some qualification and gives some leadership and gives us some insight from the Word of God how we're to behave, how we're to put our altars in. We have an election once a month, or once a year, excuse me, once a year, and we uh, have altars in our church, different uh, positions in our church of leadership, and we elect folks to be put in that position of leadership. And so, in order to be able to do that and do it according to the Word of God, we must follow the guidelines that Jesus laid out uh, in the Word of God uh, that God gave to them. So Timothy uh, is writing to uh, a, his young mentor. We studied, studied that as we did. Paul is writing to Timothy and trying to instruct him. Now, if you remember, if you've been with us through the first chapter and the second chapter, we find that Timothy is on a journey to pastor his first church. He had been with Paul for a long time on a missionary journey. He watched Paul establish churches, uh, establish preachers, putting people in positional leadership in that church, and then Paul would move from that position on to another. That was, he was one of the very first missionaries that we find in the Word of God. And he, uh, so Timothy was one of his helpers, uh, kind of a tag uh, if you would, to uh, help me for Paul. And I, I'm sure he did a lot of uh, good things that Paul took note of. And so Paul watched his life. He watched him grow in the spirit. He watched him grow in the ministry. So now he feels confident to allow Timothy to go out on his own and start a church and pastor a church. But he's giving him some instruction on what to, to look for and what to do. So first two chapters, we studied that about how he's going to encounter, things that he's going to come in contact with. Uh, we have some tremendous seminaries across the country where a young man go and study the Word of God to get prepared to go into the ministry. Those, those institutions are tremendous uh, institutions to go and learn the Word of God, to learn things about the Word of God, but they cannot, number one, teach a person how to preach. And then they will, they cannot teach them how to, to handle problems when those problems arise and there's not a church in this world that one time or another did not have a problem that we had to encounter. And we, we get through it by prayer, by a lot of uh, work, uh, sometimes a lot of asking and forgiveness. Uh, a lot of things have to come into play there in order for us to get back on that right track. So chapter 3 starts off giving uh, the bishop here who is the same, uh, has the same title as a pastor of a church. He has the same responsibility and they just use the handle here, uh, bishop, but you could take that out and put pastor in and it would work the same way. He says, if uh, this is a true thing, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now folks, I learned this a long time ago. That word desire 
really has to be there. Yes. If a person's going to do it for the fame, for the fortune, for the money, or anything like that, he might as well go sell a used car or insurance. That's right. You have to have a desire. That desire only comes from one source. Yes. And that's when the Holy Spirit calls you and God puts it on your heart to the point that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what God wants you to do. So that desire means something. You know, when we want to desire something, that means we really want it, doesn't it? Right. You know, uh, you got a big old bowl of vanilla ice cream out here with chocolate all over it. You desire that ice cream. You really want it. Don't you? Yeah. And the way you get it, the way you get it is you go and take it and then you do what with it? You enjoy it. Yeah. You, you enjoy it. You consume it. Yes. Well, a preacher has to do a whole lot of those same things. We have to desire then we have to act on that desire, and then we have to consume what the Holy Spirit is giving us so that we can present that to you and be the kind of pastor that God wants us to be. So, he said, the has to desire that. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, giving the hospitality, and then out to teach. He's telling them here, God's not calling you to be a teacher. He's calling you to be a preacher. Yes. And folks, there's a world of difference between a preacher and a pastor, or a teacher and a pastor. It's a desire that God gives you. So He said you must be. He said you must be a husband of one wife, blameless. Verse three says. Not given to wine, nor stricter, not greedy, or filthy lucre, but patient, not in a drawer, and not covetous. So, you know, I, I can't fight with you. <laughs> We're not going to get outside if we have a disagreement and settle it in the parking lot. That's not the way it works. Amen? Sometimes you feel like that, but that's not the way it works. Verse number four says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all grievance. For if a man desire, knoweth not how to rule his own house, how is he able to take care of the church of God? Amen. Now, these passages of Scripture is one of the reasons that I stand, and I don't apologize for this, but I stand that God never has never will call a woman to pray. Sorry about that. I know there's, now, God uses women in a lot of ways. There are a lot of teachers. I mean, we couldn't have Sunday schools around here something without women to teach our Sunday school. And it's all right for a woman to get up and teach, but to carry, take on the title of a pastor, they do not have the right qualifications to be able to do that. Uh, and I think he's pretty well laying out in plain English that you're going to have, because the Bible says that the husband is the head of the home, right? And so if you're going to be the head of the home, then I don't know, uh, that means you're, uh, if you're going to be a woman pastor, then you're going to have, the man's going to have to step down and a woman's going to have to take that responsibility as being the head of the home. Uh, I said, a man is the head of the home. The woman is the neck that turns it. <laughs> Not an obvious, let being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. Lifting up with pride, that's doing things on our own. Having our own way sometimes, or getting built up thinking we're better than somebody else, that we're greater. I tell folks, I'm just like you. I put my pants on one leg at a time. There's no difference in us. The only difference is now I have to sit down to do it. Yes. 
<laughs> Moreover, being a good report to them that are without. And that's one of those things that I, I try to do, but I can't do that on my own. That's where your input comes in. My report comes from you. Am I the right kind of pastor? Do I make the right kind of decision? Do I lead our church in the right direction? Are we doing the service the way God wants us to do it? Yeah. So that report has to come from you. And if you don't give a good report, then there's probably something I'm not doing right. Or you're expecting more out of me than what I can give. Let you think about that for a little bit. <laughs> Moral, he must be a good report of them that was out, lest he falls in the approach and the snares of the devil. Now, not only I give a good report, but I've got to have a report on the outside. People in the city, in our country, wherever I go, they have to know that I have a good report as a pastor. And so that helps us do what? It helps us witness. It helps us to invite people to come. And people will come because they feel like I have a good report. Yeah. They come because, you know, and I, they're not just coming because I'm the preacher. They're not just coming to hear me. But they come to hear me and then they feel the love that you give them which causes them to want to be a part of God's house yes. and of God's work. So he not falling to reproach the snare of the devil and then he gets to you, God. Our trustee, we call them trustees. The Bible talks about deacons. Deacons and trustees are the same thing. The only difference is in some churches, some denominations, they call them deacons and they ordain them just like they do the pastor. And once they're ordained, let God do that for the rest of their life. They're almost like congressmen. <laughs> uh, and that, sometimes that's a good thing, but sometimes it's not a good thing. That's right. Because you get to the point where you feel like the church cannot make a decision and the church cannot move forward unless I approve it. Because I'm an ordained deacon. The office of a deacon or a trustee, we elect our trustee, and here in the pulpit, are your responsibility and this is what God says that you must do as a trustee. Be forgiven, not double tongue. In other words, don't say one thing to me and then turn around and say something else to somebody else. We've got folks in our, and I've encountered this even in this church right here. They would say a lot of things out in the community yeah. or to other members, yeah. but they haven't got the gut to stand up and say it to me face to face. Yeah. That may be a crude way of saying that, but that's exactly what he's talking about. If you're going to be for something <coughs> or somebody else, then you need to be for it for everybody. Yes. Right, right. <clears throat> Don't be a, a, a what's the word? Two faced. Yeah, two faced. That's a good word. <laughs> Don't be two faced. I think Paul should have put that in, in the writing here, but he didn't do it. He must be not double top and not given to much wine. I can't have any wine, you just can have a little. <laughs> <laughs> what I said. It is. 
What is that? I can't have any, but you can have a little. Why he put that in there? I have no earthly idea, but that's just what the Bible said. Not greed, nor filthy lucre. If you think you're going to gain a lot of money or a lot of prestige by being a trustee, you're in the wrong business. You better, you better, when we have a lesson, you better tell them to scratch your name off that list. Because that's not what's going to happen. People are going to be looking to you. And if we do something you, we shouldn't be doing in church, it, they're not just going to blame me. That's right. They're going to blame you also. Because that's why we have, you know, I do a lot of things. But when it comes to something major, something big, like we did bought this van out here. Bill Red called me and he said, Preacher said, uh, I found this thing. Told me all about it. It was a tremendous deal. He said, Should I just go ahead and pull the trigger and buy it? And I said, No. We want to get home, get the trustees together, we want to talk to them, and then if they say okay, then we'll go back and we'll carry them a check and we'll buy the thing. That when you take it talking about a major step like that, we're going to have a trustee meeting on the next, the first Saturday of, of next month concerning our old thing. Do we keep it or do we sell it? That's not my decision. They're the ones that makes that decision. Should we do it or should we not do it? And I, we, we try to do it to where we're all in agreement. Now, they don't all have to agree on it, but it's sure great when everybody is one accord and everybody agrees for the right thing. And I said, so look, that's why we have these meetings, and that's why we uh, we talk about the things that need to be done in the church, uh, upkeep, repaired, you know. Now, Bill Ray, uh, our maintenance man, now he needs to, you know, fix a commode back here to buy a plunger or, or buy a faucet. Uh, we don't have, we're not going to wait for Sunday and call all the people <laughs> together and say, bless God, we sure do need a faucet in that bathroom back there. Do we, can I get a motion that we buy one and can I get a second? Can we all vote on it to buy a $3 profit? Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about, okay? Little things like that. I, I made a decision. Uh, what happened? Uh, Bobby, when did your house burn? Sunday? Uh, Monday, Monday. Huh? Monday. Monday. Monday night. Police department called me Monday night, about one o'clock in the morning, wondering if we could get a, if, if the church would help somebody with a motel for the night, their house burn. At that point, I didn't know it was bothering but it didn't matter. I made the decision that we would go ahead and get a motel room for that person for that night, because they were in need. And not only did they have a need, I could feel their compassion because, thank God, when our house went, we did have that field field. We did have a place to stay, you know, but these folks didn't have a place to stay. Right. The next day, I found out a corporate with Bobby, and he needed to stay another night or two, and I, I took it on myself to go ahead and say, fine, that, that's no problem. Those little decisions like that, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that the church gives me that lenient way or leeway of being able to do that. Uh, but if now, if we were going to buy him a new house, yeah, I'm not going to make that decision by him. You know? <laughs> so, you see, you see what I'm talking about. There, there, there's small things in the church that need to be taken care of. And then there's major things in the church that need to be taken care of. And one person should not be in charge of that, making that decision on their own. And I'm not going to be putting that responsibility 
I, I've been accused of running the church, but I don't run this church. I'm thankful for this church. I'm the head of the church because the Bible gives me that position. But when it comes to making decisions for the church, that's what the trustees do. And that's why they have this responsibility. And God gives them a, a biblical way of doing that. He said, Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let thee also first be proven. Now, we got a lot of men in the church. We elect seven trustees. We give you a list of people that you to vote for. But not every man in the church is on that list. Why is that true? Why is that there? They haven't approved their set. Right. Don't they have to be a member? They need to be a member. They need to be faithful. They need they have to be a tither. Because if you're not willing to support the church with your money, we're not going to put you in the responsibility of spending the church money. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And a good report. Yeah. Yes. And that is a very important thing. If you're if you're someone that always seems to be able to create, and I, I'm getting personal here because I, I, I want to with this this, this scripture. Because I, I think it's important that we understand this. If you're somebody that is grumpy, that can't get along with nobody, that has a bad disposition, we don't want you. That's right. Bottom line. And your name's not going to be on that list. Right. You say, why is that, Christian? There, there are men in the church. If you have somebody in that position, and then you have your other, there is going to be problems. Yes. And you know that up front. Yes. So that's why he gives these responsibilities, and why he puts such a such a high calling. So it's a high calling for you to be nominated for a trustee. And then it's even a higher calling if you're chosen. Because that means that because the church gets to vote on So if they vote you in, that means they have confidence in you being able to do the God the job that God has called you to do as to lead the church as a trustee. Can I ask a dumb question? Yes, ma'am. Well, it talks about being husband of one wife. So a single man cannot be a deacon or a pastor? No. That ain't what it says. Okay, then what does that mean then? It says he... The reason that Paul put that in there is because if you remember, going back to the Old Testament, right. all of the leaders back then, in most of the cases, they had multiple wives. Some of them had eight or ten or twelve wives, and then they might have Eight or ten concubines. Okay. So he said, if, if he's so married. he said, if you cannot, there's no way that you can be in a position of leadership and do what God wants you to do if you're trying to please twelve women. That's right. I have worn enough time pleasing one. <laughs> I can just imagine trying to please twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a married man in here that don't agree with me? Oh, okay. Hey, that up on the right of your hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord of mercy. But, you know, it's, uh, when we're talking about leadership, talking about this, even you know, like the treasure of our church, we got enough confidence <clears throat> And those folks, so we turn all the money that comes in that's on the plate over to them. Yes. 
and we don't question whether or not they counted it right. They did put a little in this pocket, a little in that pocket. Because we believe that they're honest and we trust them. They are, yes. If they're not, we're not going to, we don't want you in that position. That's right. And there's been a lot of happen over the years where secretaries or treasurers have stolen from churches and caused a lot of problems in the church. Yeah. It always gets found out, would it? Huh? It always gets found out. Oh, it's always gets found out. Found out. Be sure your sins will always find you out. <laughs> but, uh, but that, you know, it doesn't matter. The nursery worker. We trust whoever we put in there that they're going to take care of the kids that come in there. That's right. That they're not going to be abusers of them. That's right. uh, that they don't have a uh, pedophile background. That they're not going to abuse the children any way or other. And I could go all the way into that. That's the part of it going to go. But we put confidence in them. If they're not going to do it right, if they're abusing the kids or taking care of the way they're supposed to do, we're going to jerk them out of them. Yes. And we're going to put somebody in there that will. Because we have to know that everybody is doing it. We pull up our song service, our musicians. We put them in a position of leadership. <clears throat> I have nothing to do, and I told them, I don't pick the songs that they sing, and they don't tell me what I preach. Yes. We got a good understanding. <laughs> yeah. Now, if they have a need, as, as members of the band or as the leader of the music leader, then we talk about it. But that's the only time they come to me. They may look at my wife and sing a song that she wants to sing, but you have that same privilege. You got one that's doing one thing, they'll do it, they'll do it, you know. But, but we're trusting that they're going to be here, that they're going to do the job that they're supposed to do. And folks, everybody in our church that has a position of leadership, including these folks here, they get not one dime for what they're doing. And sometimes we all take that for granted and we don't appreciate them and tell them how much we appreciate exactly. what they do for our church. Yeah. Their music sets the stage for my message. Amen. If they have, if they have a lousy music program, which I've never heard them do, but if they have a lousy music program, there's no way in the world that I can follow that and try to put in any enthusiasm in y'all or try to get get anything accomplished. That's not right. If y'all already bored still and upset because we sang the same song six Sundays in a row. That's not my <laughs> I was exaggerating. <laughs> but that, that, that's, why, that's why Paul is, is telling Timothy, he said, you've got to put people in. You can't do it by yourself. You know, you want to Stand on your pedestal because you stand up here on that platform higher than anybody else. And that puts you higher than anybody else. He said, if you don't have people in places of responsibility, when we first came to the church, and I always share this with you right quick and move it on. We had three men to take on the whole responsibility of the church. They have 13. It's not hard to govern 13 people. <laughs> but we had no music. Period. We've had one lady come and play the piano a little bit since I've been here. I've been here nearly 14 years. 
We never had a full time piano player. Bless our heart, Lily. We did hand music. We've had some church of Christ services. We lost several of Whatever it took to get through that part of it where I could get up and pray for And she did a tremendous job. Yes. We appreciate her. But the greatest thing that ever happened in her life I had a plane into that. He's not sitting over here. But plane out of the window. They leave you out. But it's important that we have people in a right position, right position of leadership. But it's also more important that we show those folks that we appreciate so much. You folks have been so good to Tommy and I at the church, and we can never, ever tell you or show you how much y'all mean to us and how much y'all have done for us to be here and how much we've enjoyed these past few years. And I'm hoping and praying if you leave me around long enough that I have another 13 years. He said, even so, must their wife. All right, ladies, listen up. We're going to get to you now. Where's my wife? <laughs> even so, must their wife be given gravy? Gravy? That's a good word, isn't it? I didn't know they engraved, but that's what right. <laughs> Not slanderous. Sober. Don't know why those in there. <laughs> Faithful in all things. So we put a deacon or somebody in a position of leadership when they're Elected, their wife is elected too. Yes. Even though she's not on about it. But if she don't stand behind him and support him and be as faithful to him as he can, then he don't need to be in that position. Because we're going to be looking at you in a to make sure that you're standing in the right position that you need to be. That's a young man in this church. We love nothing better than you. But he can't fit the bill. He doesn't have a wife that will stand behind him. Well, that is important. When we came to this church, of course, it's my wife, first time to be a pastor's wife. That's awesome. And she didn't know how to act. We went to our first pastor's conference in, in, in uh, Arkansas. Well, they had a special class where they took all the preacher's wives and the women and everything, and they went down and they had their little class, and they met with those guys, and we had, a, had our little class. It was just a, a, a time of refreshing, a time of uh, kind of getting to know one another, uh, talk about the trouble that we had from or whatever. And my wife came out of that service that night and went back to the motel and she said, I don't have my women put up with me. She's awesome. Yes. She said, I listened to those ladies and they talked about how they had to be uh, dressed a certain way the way they had to walk, the way they had to talk, the way they had to act, yeah. they had to act, you know, they couldn't they couldn't be a part uh, of a lady coming down and, and, and maybe cleaning the commode in the bathroom. That was above them. They couldn't get into that position. 
That was for people under them to do. Oh. And they saw them feel that way. Wow. And my wife looked at them and said, Here I am. They're going to take me like I am. Yeah. 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 She doesn't do it. I love you. <laughs> she doesn't dress in a perfect way. Because she don't have it. She's human. She always was a knife. Yes, she does. She takes a bath every Saturday. <laughs> Whether she needs it or not. <laughs> so, you know, I mean. I but I guarantee you. I didn't have it. But a better support in my ministry. And you can relate to my kids. And you guys that are trustees, if you don't feel that same way about your wife, then you need to resign. Yes. Bottom line. Because she, if she, she is your helpmate. She's there to support you and to help you do what God wants you to do. So the wife has a big responsibility also. All right, where is the I'm on 12. Let the deacon be the husband of one wife, the ruler, and rule their children and their own house well. For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. We'll leave off right there because I'm going to close with this. And the reason I believe that Paul put that last verse in the Bible is because he uh, made that mistake the other night and almost didn't make it. Uh, because he wanted Timothy to understand that the position that you put people in, that they need to be in that position because of what they want to. Before we put somebody's name on the ballot, I go to that person personally and I ask them, are they willing to serve? And if they say no, and we had that last year, y'all remember, someone had a name to be just taken off. And that's okay. It's nothing against you. If you don't feel like you can fulfill that office to the best of your ability, then you don't need to be in that position. And there is a great responsibility placed on you. Because when you start looking at spending forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars of God's money, that's a big responsibility. And it happens. It happens. We do that. And so they must take that responsibility on and they must take it on with the understanding. That what they do, they're doing for the honor and glory of God, not for their own glory. Let's take it. Father, we thank you for the way, can anybody give me a ride home? <laughs> I was about to suggest, Pastor, you know, I met a super agent the year before. You got two heads? I want to thank you so much for your blessing, Lord. We thank you for leaving the time and to come. And Lord, I do thank you so much, Lord, from the bottom of my heart tonight. Because I, I think I've got some of the greatest men and women that a pastor could ever want and could ever have. Lord, I thank 
thank you for the hard work, the dedication, the prayer, the supplications, and the sacrifices that they make every day. And Lord, I just ask you to go with them, bless their home tonight, and Lord, just bring us all back to thy house this coming Lord's Day. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.